Okay, we were going to record the, 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 the meeting for, 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 the, for the project and for somehow follow up. Uh, so thanks really everybody for, for joining the AI and Society Roundtable. I am Dino Pedreschi, uh, from, uh, a professor from University of Pisa, uh, one of the organizers of the event. Uh, before, first of all, I would like to, to leave the room, uh, the floor for a second, for, uh, for a welcome to Professor Paul Lukovic from DFKI, who is the coordinator of the Human AI uh, Network Project. Please, Paul. Yeah, thank you. So I won't be taking long for boring welcome speeches. I'm very happy that we are hosting that event. Thanks a lot to Dino and his team for organizing it. Thanks a lot for all our distinguished speakers to being here and sharing their thoughts at the time with us. And I really think that this is a very relevant topic. And, and what I really enjoy is that we have been working on this topic together with many people of this group, maybe for the last decade, going back to our future ICT flagship proposal uh, through the Humane AI flagship proposal to this running project. And to give the idea of the vision behind the project and obviously behind the round table, Chiara will show you now our promotional project video. And please excuse us, it's a high profile, non-scientific promotional video, but I still think it transmits the vision, the idea that we all believe in and want to pursue quite well. So again, thank you very much for being here. Enjoy and let this be a very creative meeting. So Chiara, please. Roads. With Humane AI-Net, we will guide Europe towards a better future, a new era, or humanity with AI from Europe. The potential of artificial intelligence is massive. Imagine businesses and factories prospering and being profitable while providing their employees good working hours, health care, equality and the best benefits of a working life. Humane AINet is about technology that will help Europe achieve this vision and sustain it in a competitive globalized world. For people, for the planet and for prosperity. What we really need to do is think about AI as a way of empowering human beings, making human beings better. A brighter future requires science. In Humane AI Net, we are working on science and innovations for humans. We will work to create AI that respects human autonomy, AI that is fair, transparent and within the rule of law. AI that increases our abilities as workers, our insight as decision makers, our enjoyment as customers, and our well-being as individuals. AI that helps strengthen our democracy and assure a better society for all. From Turkey to Ireland, from Portugal to the Scandinavian North, within Humane AI Net, researchers, innovators and practitioners join forces to leverage the AI revolution, to strengthen the European economy and society and to empower all people across Europe. With the concept of micro-projects, we combine the benefits of a pan-European network with the research in small agile groups to provide tangible results that will drive European research and innovation. With the AI revolution in full swing, key industrial players are already engaged in Humane AI Net to build an innovation ecosystem where all companies, from small to big, can grow. What would be my dream is to really change the future to something we all want to live in.
Okay, welcome back to from the, the commercial, <laughs> and thanks very much, Paul, uh, Paul Lukovic, for for the introduction. Uh, welcome to our speakers, uh, Sandy Pantel and Stuart Russell, Mona Sloan, Laura Sartori. Thanks for for, for joining us. I would like uh, to to use uh, uh, just a few minutes to somehow set the, the stage for for the the speakers. Uh, and let me uh, uh, share a quick presentation. Uh, allow me just a second for that. Okay. And uh, uh, I, I would simply like, uh, in, in my, let's say, in my quality of the, the, the scientific coordinator for this uh, social AI part of the human AI net, the, the, this broad uh, project about human-centered AI, I would simply like to, to tell a few words uh, why the, the social uh, dimension of AI is emerging with such a strong uh, take uh, recently. And the point is that there are emerging uh, uh, increasingly complex social technical system made of interacting people, algorithms, machine, that make very clear that uh, we need to better study the, the social uh, dimension of this uh, hybrid uh, systems. And we, because we have very evident examples around us, the, the mobility system with travelers helped in their decision making by smart assistants, or the public discourse and in general the markets of the social networks where the, the diffusion of opinion and, 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 and as well as the, the financial and economic decision are uh, increasingly shaped by uh, uh, recommendation algorithms and, and influenced by, by personalized uh, suggestions. Uh, so what's the, the, the point here? What's the key uh, issue, in my opinion? Uh, the point is that uh, we have devised these tools in this first uh, two decades of the 20th uh, century in, in, a, uh, in a way that they assist individuals in making individually intelligent or optimal choices. Uh, like, for instance, uh, finding the best route to my destination in the traffic, or finding best products or most interesting contents or most interesting peers to connect to for me, for my profile, for what is I like most or for what I resemble most. And the, uh, with a kind of implicit assumption that uh, a crowd of intelligent people made even more intelligent by machine uh, and algorithms uh, it's, uh, it's going to be intelligent. And this is unfortunately is not the case. Actually, we have many examples where a combination, a hybrid system of uh, a supposedly individually intelligent uh, uh, agents are collectively stupid and are not going the direction we would like to, to have. One example uh, is for sure traffic, right? Uh, of course, navigation systems are giving us individual advices that from a, the, the point of view of the individual driver are completely meaningful, make sense, uh, are uh, uh, interesting, and in most cases they are, but they can also create a, a very uh, complex uh, situation if too many people are, are somehow nudged to go in a certain direction, for instance, to, to avoid a, a congestion somewhere, to create an even worse such a congestion somewhere else, or simply to systematically increase the traffic on certain uh, on certain roads and artificially instead uh, uh, segregate other uh, parts of the city that are not advised uh, to, to go for, for, for any specific reason with potential problems in increasing risk, uh, increasing congestions on certain roads and creating some forms of segregation in other parts of the of the of the cities. Another example, of course, is the public discourse, right? The, the, the increasing polarization that we observe in, in the, on the public sphere, on, uh, on, on the media ecosystem and, in, and on the social media ecosystem in particular. Uh, this is, of course, something that it's uh, genuinely due to the confirmation bias that human, the humans have, right? The fact that we actually like to, to, to be exposed to contents and peers that are like us that are like-minded. But uh, the point is that if we, on top of this, uh, of this system, we also put uh, 
mechanism that uh, 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 reinforce our confirmation bias, provide suggestions that go in the direction of what we like most, we run the risk of creating even stronger bubbles, even stronger uh, echo chambers and, and possible radicalization uh, path for users. It, it is amazing how we have models explaining that uh, algorithmic bias of the platforms uh, that follows this conformity idea can even bring uh, polarization and segregation of ideas in cases where the crowd would uh, reach a consensus otherwise, so totally artificial. But still, we need to understand better this kind of phenomena uh, in, in, in reality and to understand how polarization works. And, and for uh, markets and, and networks, we know that from, from, from uh, complex system science, from, uh, uh, from, from the social sciences, we know that there is a tendency of networks to develop, uh, to develop hubs, right? To, to, to develop uh, uh, a very unequal distribution of, for instance, the links that, that gets uh, 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 to, to the different nodes in a freely evolving network. And because there is a, a, a form of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, emergent properties in these networks uh, such that uh, uh, nodes with more links are uh, have more ability to attract new links providing a very skewed uh, sc scale free distribution where a few hubs are able to uh, to uh, uh, attract most of the resources in the system. And this, of course, is a kind of metaphor for what happens in the economic markets, in the, in the, in, in the social, in the, what happens to popularity in, in, in uh, social networks or social media, telling us that if we provide, again, mechanisms that are artificially increasing this mechanism, we really run the risk of increasing inequality, of uh, fostering a, a larger and stronger monopolies and concentrating power, popularity and resources in a few hands. So it, it, this is to say that uh, the, 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 the agenda, the, the scientific agenda that we have in front of us is actually how to shape uh, AI mechanism in a direction that instead of uh, going uh, against us, it actually helps us not only at the individual level, but also at the societal level to pursue uh, 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 objectives that we strive for. Um, uh, how can we devise uh, mechanisms that are able to uh, push us towards uh, sustainability, environmental sustainability, towards diversity and pluralism rather than polarization, to better justice and, and equality, and, and of course also a better care of common goods, because all these kind of uh, uh, examples I gave you today, like the traffic examples, are essentially coordination problems on top of a common good, which is the, the, uh, the common road network and, and the, the transportation infrastructure. So essentially how we can devise uh, uh, some gentler technology that can help us to find uh, a richer, actually, uh, human dimension, a, a more social aware human dimension, a better balance between individual and collective, need, collective needs, a better balance between what we perceive as personal freedom and the freedom of our fellow, uh, fellow citizens. This is essentially the, 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 the key uh, observation for today's conversation. Uh, how can we shape uh, the agenda of, uh, but, but from a multidisciplinary point of view, of uh, uh, AI and society. Mm -hmm. uh, what I really would like to that, that we have in the in the in the next two and a half hour, is a collective intelligence exercise toward trying to shape what are the technical research questions of social AI from different angles. We have uh, not only AI experts with us; we also have uh, uh, network scientists, complexity. Uh, science uh, uh, experts, we have social scientists, socioeconomic scientists, we would like somehow, uh, my, uh, 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 what I really would like is that we try to be today an intelligent crowd, aiming, for, uh, building on this diversity uh, of point of viewpoints to, to come up with, uh, with, with some uh, um, idea how to advance uh, this area. 
the organization of the of the conversation is that now we have four fantastic uh, fire star fire starters. We don't have fire women or fire men, but we have actually uh, uh, the, the, the real fire starters, burning uh, people that I really hope will will uh, challenge uh, uh, all of us with uh, with uh, intellectual provocation from different angles. We have. Uh, uh, Sandy Pentelen for for MIT, uh, one of the creator of uh, media media lab, a, 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 a thinker, not only a, a tremendously impactful AI scientist. We have Laura Sartori, uh, a, 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 a sociologist uh, that has a lot of uh, things to tell us around the social implications of uh, of technologies and, and AI in, in particular. We have. Uh, Stuart Russell, professor at uh, UC Berkeley, uh, a mythical professor of, of uh, artificial intelligence, the author of uh, the, the standard textbook of the field and the director of the human compatible AI lab at Berkeley. And, uh, and we have Mona Sloan, uh, a, a researcher at the NYU uh, Responsible AI uh, Institute. Uh, a key a leading international figure uh, around the, the, the social uh, impact of, uh, of, of AI and, and the digital technologies with a focus on uh, inequality and, uh, and design, uh, value sensitive design of technology in society. So we will stay together uh, with this uh, four five starters until, until five. And then we will move in four breakout session for, for from uh, from five to six p.m. Uh, you see the the, the titles that were uh, selected are this four: bias, inequality, polarization, and social good. Uh, please uh, uh, spread uh, after the the the, the 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 plenary session in this four for for an hour or so. Uh, leave ten minutes at the end before six. Before we uh, meet again at six all together for a restitution, a short restitution session where uh, the, the mentors and rapporteurs from the four, for the four breakouts will update us on the discussion that, that uh, uh, has happened in the, in the four breakouts. So this is essentially what I wanted to say. Thanks a lot for, uh, uh, to all the participants to this uh, exercise. Thanks to the people who helped uh, me organize this. Chiara, Boldrini, Letizia Milli, Laura Sartori. Uh, thanks to the projects, uh, to the twin projects of human AI that uh, uh, are supporting this, uh, this initiative. Uh, this is what I wanted to say. And uh, it is uh, now really my pleasure to leave the floor to the first fire starter, uh, Sandy Pentland, Alex uh, Sandy Pentland. Great, Sandy. thank you. Uh, let me do this. So I'm going to give a very sort of short uh, uh, fire starter. But it's interesting because what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about uh, formal models that have been verified with people in large scale human experiments to give you a mathematical framework to be able to think about many of the things that, that Dino just talked about. And um, I run this initiative at MIT called Connection Science. I'm also on the board of directors of the UN's Sustainable Development uh, Data and Accountability Board uh, and involved in many similar sorts of things. So the, the key observation is that social species, all social species, not just humans, uh, do something called foraging. They exploit their environment, but they also explore. And there's this tension between exploration and exploitation. And the optimal way to do this is something called Thompson sampling. It's optimal in the sense of minimum regret. You, you look back and say, I did the best I could with the information I have. And it's a very simple strategy. So you look at the choices you have, and you pick the ones that have been working well. And in a experiment with hundreds of thousands of people making financial decisions, we show that this works uh, as you would expect, including a little bit of bias for uh, uh, people not letting go of poor choices. 
But this formula includes a prior probability also. So you say, what's the likelihood this works? But what's the prior probability also? And social species, including people, get this from social cues. They look at what other people do. So if that other person eats the blueberries and gets sick, then the prior on the blueberries goes down. If they do some investment, if they make some choice and it goes up, then the probability of you choosing that should go up. And in fact, that's exactly what people do. Again, over hundreds of thousands of people in many different situations. And that produces mathematically a posterior, which is the optimal minimum regret uh, way of choosing what to do. And what people do is they do a thing called probability matching, which is not just take the maximum, but spread your bets across things proportional to the probability. And we have a paper in Cognition, which is the leading uh, cognitive science journal, showing that this is very precisely what people do. And it has many of the characteristics uh, that we talk about, but provides a formal framework uh, for understanding these. So um, Thompson sampling, sorry, this came in backwards. Thompson sampling gives you this minimum regret formula for collective intelligence, but it relies on having the social network information be an honest sample. And of course, marketing, technical means, all sorts of things can give rise to cascades, crashes, and panics. And, and many of the phenomena we see have come from this sort of thing where people are making what appear to be perfectly rational choices but their social information is biased or wrong in some way. And examples of this sort of thing are in Bitcoin, in stock, uh, in all sorts of political things. And the question is, is how can we prevent such extreme events? How can we do what Dina was talking about is prevent dominant agents, these, these, these people that, uh, and companies and uh, things that control the discussion to such an extent that you no longer get collective intelligence. And we have just published a paper in the uh, Proceedings of the National Academy of Science analyzing this formally for all attachment networks. So this is social media, but it's also financial media. It's also voting behavior. Anything that is an attachment uh, uh, network, which generically is something where people use this social prior to help them make choices. And what we show mathematically is that the winner take all thing, these hubs, these disproportionate agents, uh, are not something that has uh, distinguishing features necessarily of themselves. It's a function of how they compare to the rest of the, the actors in the network. So if you have a network with certain characteristics, uh, then you will not get these disproportionate actors. If you have an act, uh, a network with other characteristics, then you will. And this is just basic mathematics. This is not about human nature, but of course human nature is constrained by this basic reality. And, and the key insight here is that if you want to get rid of winner-take-all sorts of phenomena, things like Google or Facebook, um, the key is not to limit them necessarily. That's actually a very inefficient way to do it. It's to raise up the rest of the actors. So as a practical matter, that would mean, for instance, that Facebook and Google should not buy, should not be allowed to buy small companies because those are the things that have the high fitness and will eventually produce a, a, a competition. And again, this is not about politics or anything like that. This is just the math. Um, and we have a, a way of measuring this that is mathematically sound. And the types of things that you can do in this, we have a, a paper in the Stanford Law Review about how to do this in the case of antitrust. You could limit the, the, the key is limiting the network power, the social power, so that the competition can be fair and pre 
throw up innovative new companies. So a bad example is you just put a threshold on the number of repetitions of any social media uh, post. If you put a, a, a limit of, say, 100 repetitions on any post, you get rid of most of the fake news. That's the observation by David Lazar. But of course, you also get rid of propagation of good ideas, right? You make the good ideas propagate very slowly. So another way to do that is simply to empower other actors. And Dino mentioned that I have a new book called uh, uh, Building a New Economy, which talks about how we can do this uh, and how we have done this in the cases of labor unions and other things and uh, gives a sort of outline for how to do this. So the key thing here is, is that the problem is not so much the winner take all, but that the, the rest of the network is not sufficiently fit to compete. And the winner take all tend to smash the young companies, the, the less powerful, and what that does is that allows them to have increased power. And that's where uh, a lot of the things that we look at, you know, collective stupidity versus collective intelligence uh, have their source. So I'll just stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sandy. Uh, very clear message. I don't want to lose any time and would we'll end over now to the next uh, speaker. Was Laura Sartori. Uh, uh, Laura, yes. the floor Hi. is yours. Yes, thanks. So I'm really delighted to participate at this roundtable because I think it is time to take this conversation to the next level. I think it is time to consolidate a fruitful collaboration among all those engaged in artificial intelligence. And we know we are coming from all sorts of background. And as Dino asked before, how do we shape the agenda? And I start with two examples and finish with the two final take home messages uh, with some questions that try to fire the discussion in the round table. So the first example is about the job market, both in hiring and internal progressions. And as you may know, uh, one fam famous example dates back to some years ago when Amazon decided to delegate much of the HR to some AI systems. And the decision was shortly overturned when it was discovered that men were being hired and advanced much more than women. And for the first time, the gender bias in data hit and startled the scientific community. But today, more than half of the HR in industry are using predictive algorithms to make hiring choices. And the second example is about mortgages and consumer credit. Recent work by Laura Blattner and Scott Nelson um, shows that differences in mortgage approval between minority and minority and majority groups is not just down to bias, as we know, but also to noise in data. That means lack of precision. And the novelty that I want to underline here is that minorities and low income groups have less data in their credit histories and files. So we can go on and on with examples in college applications or food stamps or welfare services allocation. But the point is, why does it happen? And the short answer is social phenomena are complex, okay. Society is baked with multiple structures of inequalities, and we often forget that. And I want to draw attention, especially to one word that is intersectionality, because I think that intersectionality is a key feature of social phenomena that we is usually is oversimplified. So by now we know that we need more equitable AI systems, making sure that models and data and algorithms are not designed to weed out some specific group like women or ethnic minorities or some LGBTQI group. But the point is that we must keep working on the how to do that. 
And as a community, we have been having multiple discussions about bias and about ethics. So uh, we know that these are necessary tasks, but I think that we, we should go beyond. And, uh, and so uh, we, we can uh, take the conversation to the next level by doing what? Two things. One is having less bias and more precise data. But even more important probably is that we need data sets, need an equal share of data distributed over all social groups involved. So as we were saying before, if minority groups have less data in their credit histories, this is the new problem. And the second thing that I would like to underline is that we need so to go beyond that. We need to look at the wider problem. I would say the wider picture. In our examples, that would be labor and consumer credit markets. And so we need to understand how they are embedded in institutional and social frameworks that heavily influence their functioning. So considering the broader social, economic, or political issue that we are addressing through some AI application is the only way to escape the problem of technological fixing. So not every social problem has a technical solution or maybe not just a technical solution. And this is because what I said just two minutes ago, that means it is because of the inequality, intersectionality and the complexity that makes society what it is. Technology can automate existing inequalities and actually it has already had. AI could become the next inequality engine and we need to remember that to try to avoid it. As a sociologist, the first take home message is the following. Only an integrated uh, multidisciplinary AI community could go beyond the solutionism approach that treat social phenomena as in need for a technical solution. And the social sciences should strongly participate into this conversation. And just want to remember that science and technology are usually incremental in nature while social sciences could be radical in their capacity of reimagining technology and its future applications. And this is the only way to counterbalance the potential for automating inequalities. So my question to you are, how do we design future AI systems that reflect the intersectionality and the overlapping structures of inequalities of the real world? How could AI design limit the Matthew effect? How do we grow as a community, this kind of integrated community? So I want to move to the second point. And to do that, I want to cite Kate Crawford that many of you for sure know that has just published a book titled Atlas of AI. And I want to cite her by saying that AI is neither artificial nor intelligent. It's not artificial because it is made by man with natural resources. And it's not intelligent although it seems so, because it seems to be autonomous, but actually it requires people. It requires people in charge of performing tasks, for example, labeling data. And here I would like to re remind the book by Mary L. Gray that well described the underworld of the ghost workers. So the point is that AI is not immaterial. AI is made of structures of production, is made of materialities that we cannot overlook. It is made of labor processes, classificatory logics. It is made above all probably of power structure that we need to contemplate and integrate to really finalize AI for the social good. And so the second take home message is that if we really want to look and analyze the impact, the implication of 
AI on society, we need to start thinking the process all over, starting from the very beginning, when you can have the most impact on people's behaviors and attitudes, not after. So it's a kind of redesigning it, not only fixing it. And on this last point, my question to you and for the roundtables are, who benefit or who does not benefit by the extensive use of AI systems? How do we better reflect the social complexity of the real world? And really my last words are a sort of call for diversity. How can we make the whole process more diverse, more diverse in design, in development and in use? So I stop here and leave the floor to the next speaker. Thanks, Laura. <laughs> the questions are clear. Uh, and I would swiftly go through with the, the next speaker, that's Stuart. Stuart Russell, please, the, the floor is yours. Thanks for being with us. Thank you very much, Dino. Um, and uh, so I thoroughly agree with the remarks of the previous two speakers. Um, I want to offer maybe a slightly different view or a complementary view um, about how we think about AI systems. So we all know that things have not been going all that well recently. Uh, despite rapid advances in the technology, um, the public seems to become becoming less and less enchanted with AI. So I take it that this question from Forbes is a rhetorical question. Um, we have the rise of disinformation and fake news, which is partly powered by AI. Uh, we have increasingly creepy impersonation of human beings, both visually uh, and voice. Uh, we have, uh, it appears now, AI systems that are actually deciding to kill human beings. Um, we worry about the replacement of humans in employment. Um, and uh, we have a sort of rolling disaster with social media. So let's look at this social media catastrophe. And um, there are many, many different lenses on what's going on, but here's one, which is that the social media platforms want to maximize some objective. So they write algorithms that maximize click-through or engagement, or more recently, you know, some measure of community well-being, which is a thinly disguised version of click-through. Um, and I think, just to give them the benefit of a doubt, that originally they expected the algorithms to learn what it is that people want to look at. Um, and so they don't keep sending people things they don't want to look at. Uh, but these are very, very powerful algorithms. They have more control over what uh, human beings see and read and learn about than any dictator in history. Um, and they've been written with exactly zero regulation um, and zero understanding of the effect that they were going to have. Um, and the algorithms don't learn what people want. In fact, um, what they learn to do is to modify people to be more predictable because that way, uh, like, like any reward maximizing system, they're gonna generate more reward in the long term if they change people uh, so that they can predict their um, click behavior better. Uh, and so that's what they've done. And that seems, I think, to be uh, pushing people towards extremes um, where they will consume the red meat that the algorithms are then gonna send them uh, and that entire industries have sprung up to supply. And in fact, if you think about it, e even though these are very, very simple learning algorithms, if we improved the AI, we would have a much bigger catastrophe on our hands because they would be much better at manipulating people um, and uh, they would be much more profitable and therefore much more difficult to turn off. And even though we know these things are happening, we can't turn off the algorithms because they generate so much money for the owners of the algorithms. If we look at biased AI, the same thing is going on. One way to think about bias is that it's, it's not so much that you know, least squares is a racially biased algorithm. Um, it isn't a racially biased algorithm. 
uh, it's that it's the wrong objective. Uh, we don't want to maximize accuracy on the training data, particularly uh, as in the case of Amazon, uh, if the training data uh, is generated by a socially biased process in the first place. Um, so both of these examples come from maximizing uh, a wrong objective. Now you might say, okay, well, then we should fix the objective. Let's, you know, let's do AI for good. Let's maximize some, you know, completely unobjectionable objective like, you know, literacy or health or, you know, social harmony or whatever. Uh, but if you actually took that literally as an AI system uh, and you were sufficiently powerful and intelligent and you had access to the internet, for example, um, then you might well be able to maximize literacy. But the problem with this type of objective um, is that maximizing, say, literacy is equivalent to setting the weights on all other objectives to zero. Right? And clearly, this is wrong. So there's nothing wrong with improving literacy, but you can't improve literacy at the cost of everything else. And that's exactly what the algorithm is going to do if you set literacy as the objective. And so this is a basically, I think, a, a sort of a, a mental block that we've had for a long time, which is a kind of a closed world semantics for objectives, when in fact there should be an open world semantics for objectives. It's when someone says, I, I want to maximize literacy, they don't mean I want to maximize literacy. What they mean is literacy is one of the things I want to maximize. And that's an open world semantics. Uh, and we need algorithms that know that there are other objectives, but know that they don't know what they are. Um, and so if we go back into the, you know, the very early days of AI, I think it's quite reasonable to look around and say, okay, what definition of intelligence do we have that we could actually formalize and, and then transfer to machines? And I think, you know, um, people like Ramsey and then von Neumann and Morgenstern, uh, building on a long tradition in philosophy uh, and economics, um, had this idea of formal rationality, uh, which in, in English says you're intelligent to the extent that your actions can be expected to achieve your objectives. And then we just transferred that to machines. Machines are intelligent to the extent that their actions can be expected to achieve their objectives. And then we developed this methodology of writing down objectives, plugging them into the machine and off the machines go uh, and optimize the objective. Um, and this is where things go wrong because we don't know how to write down objectives completely and correctly, right? We have objectives, we have preferences about the future, but it's extremely difficult to write them down correctly. So what we want is machines whose actions can be expected to achieve our objectives, uh, which are objectives that are in us and not in the machines. Uh, so this is what we want. This is a more difficult problem than the standard problem of AI but it's actually the one we want to solve. And it turns out to be, I think, solvable. Um, and it leads to a framework that I've been calling assistance games. So uh, here's a simple one with one human, one machine. Uh, so the human has some preferences about the future uh, and the machine has to satisfy them, but it doesn't know what they are. Uh, and this turns out to be a, you know, a well-formulated mathematical problem that uh, the machine can solve. And when it solves it, it produces behaviors that the classical optimizing algorithm doesn't produce. Uh, it defers to people. It co may come up with ideas for how to behave, but it will often have an incentive to ask permission before carrying out those plans because it knows that it doesn't know the desirability or otherwise of some of the side effects of the plan. Uh, and in the extreme case, it will allow itself to be switched off, whereas the classical optimizer would actually prevent itself from being switched off uh, so that it can optimize the objective. So lots of interesting behaviors come out and there's tons of research to do on how to solve these assistance games. Um, I'll mention just a, a little bit of this research. One, uh, one interesting set of questions comes up when 
you have an AI system that is acting not on behalf of one person, but many people, maybe the whole human race. Um, and this is, of course, the same kind of problem that social scientists and moral philosophers have been struggling with for thousands of years. How do we aggregate human preferences? So there are some analytical results. And um, Harsanyi, for example, uh, showed in his social aggregation theorem that every Pareto optimal policy, meaning every policy that isn't strictly or sometimes weakly dominated by some other policy, uh, optimizes a linear combination of the preferences of the individuals. Um, and then he argues basically by symmetry or fairness that the, the weights in that linear combination should all be the same. Um, and that leads to what he calls preference utilitarianism. Um, but this theorem assumes that uh, all the individuals share a common prior belief about the future. And when you remove that assumption where people can have different beliefs about the future, uh, then it turns out that every Pareto optimal policy has weights that change over time. Uh, and the people whose beliefs about the future turn out to be correct, get larger weights uh, in the overall preference function that's being optimized by the machine. Uh, this is very apparently inegalitarian. I mean, you can really get sort of exponentially large differences in weighting very quickly. Um, now, why is this? this weird looking uh, kind of policy Pareto optimal, it's because everyone thinks that they're right and therefore they insist on this policy compared to the one that uses a fixed weight for each individual. Okay, so this is just a mathematical theorem as Alex uh, Sandy was saying, um, and uh, we just have to live with it and figure out what the consequences are. Um, and I think, as, as Sandy also pointed out, we're going to have to deal with millions or billions or trillions of uh, different machine agents that are going to be part of our world. And how do we ensure or uh, coordination, how do we avoid coordination failures? So even if they all are designed according to the principles of maximizing human benefit, um, there are still potentially coordination issues um, you know, unless one corporation designs them all and they, they essentially operate as a huge shared memory machine, uh, which is very unlikely to happen. So how do we get to them to uh, coordinate? So one approach um, that uh, my colleague Andrew Critch has been proposing is called open source game theory. So that means uh, game theory where um, everyone can read the code of all the other agents. And, uh, and then use that ability to prove properties about each other that in some cases will allow zero shot coordination. So you don't have to play iterative games or converge to coordination. Uh, you can actually prove things. And uh, so one interesting theorem that, uh, that we've shown, which might be surprising, is if you write uh, an agent uh, let's say you're doing prisoner's dilemma, an agent that says, I'm going to defect unless I can prove that you're going to cooperate with me, right? That sounds extremely vicious, right? That that agent actually is a nicer agent than the one that says, I'm going to cooperate with you unless I can prove that you're going to defect, right? You might think that that's a nice agent, but actually it turns out not to be. Uh, and the defect unless proof of cooperation uh, will end up cooperating with other copies of itself, with other copies of the other agent, whereas the cooperate unless proof of defection won't end up doing that uh, and will defect in, in uh, a larger set of cases. So there's lots of work to do there. It's really interesting. Um, we know we can actually do it without direct access to the code. We can use the techniques of proof carrying code uh, so that people can keep their code secret as long as they have proofs of the properties that their, their program satisfy. Uh, so let me wrap up by saying that um, I think it's reasonable to propose that it's rational for humanity to build machines that solve assistance games, right? These are the machines that it is rational for us to deploy. Uh, not easy to figure out exactly what that's gonna look like. And it brings in all the socio-technical questions 
that uh, Laura and Sandy mentioned. Um, but the implication is that that's what we should build. Um, and we as AI researchers should actually avoid the temptation uh, to build in our own moral values. So let me give you a simple example of that, right? Uh, I had a big argument in, in another forum with, with Rich Sutton, who was arguing that we, um, we should actually give uh, much more weight to the well being of animals uh, than we do. And so that's arguing that we should build machines that bring about ends that we don't prefer. And I would argue that's simply not a valid uh, way of proceeding, and it's not right for AI researchers to do that. Now, we might think that uh, animals deserve more, uh, more weight in our overall preference function than they currently have, and we can argue with the rest of humanity about that, but it's not our job uh, to build in that type of moral argument uh, into the machines we build. So we should be intermediaries for the preferences of, of humanity. Okay, thanks. Thank you, thank you, Stuart, very much. Uh, actually, I uh, I had a slide in my in my deck that I decided not to show. That is precisely about what the the, the Turing tests for intelligence should should look like today. And actually, I use this very similar word into yours. The system is intelligent, and the AI system is intelligent to the measure uh, to it, it allows us to be more intelligent to to solve tasks at which we are not good in solving. Uh, which is very much in the spirit of your of your of your contribution. Thanks a lot. I would really uh, be very uh, happy to to close this session with uh, with Mona Sloan from NYU Responsible AI Institute. Mona, thanks for being with us, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Dino. And I just want to say I'm very honored to be on this distinguished panel, and I'm very excited to be here. And please excuse me as I'm going to shift gears a little bit uh, and uh, be the social scientist, uh, the other social scientist in the room. And what I want to do is introduce uh, the significance of design uh, into the conversation. And I'm going to do my very best to keep to time. So I want to place this conversation into the context of both design and inequality, because I think it is insufficient to look at technology as sort of uh, a problem extraordinaire that is special. There are certain things that are special to the way in which the systems that we call AI are designed and do things and intervene in our social fabric. But I think it is useful to contextualize this with the kinds of inequalities and issues that we've seen uh, before. So what is design inequality? I'm just gonna show you a couple of images. This is Sao Paulo where you can see a very strong uh, class divide in the built infrastructure. This is so-called defensive architecture that I'm sure you're all familiar with and have seen at some point. These are, these are spikes under an underpass that are designed to keep out homeless, the homeless population from seeking shelter. This is a very strong case of design inequality. This is the Grenfell Tower fire that happened in 2017 in the summer, which killed 72 people who lived in the social housing block. The fire um, could spread this quickly because the design specifications for the new cladding um, were so that it didn't have to be not flammable. Also, these built, this building did not have to have uh, sprinklers. So let's link this to artificial intelligence. And, and Laura has beautifully outlined, and, and all the previous speakers have said this as well, that artificial intelligence technologies have become integral to society in the sense that they are actively enrolled in the way in which we organize society and also the way in which we stratify society. It is you know, in the decision-making processes around loans, insurances and services. It is in our education, especially in the pandemic and everything uh, related to remote uh, education and proctoring, for example. It is in precision medicine and law enforcement and immigration enforcement, management, supply chain management, and so on. Now, I'm gonna build on Shoshana Zuboff's uh, notion of surveillance capitalism. This is from her book that came out in 2019, where she says, well, we are actually living in a world that is characterized by the trading in behavioral futures. So the kind of social practice of analyzing data 
in order to make a prediction as to what is likely to happen next has become a dominant commercial activity that characterizes not only how we do business, but how we do society. Um, and so we can trace this kind of back uh, to um, kind of the Exos data that was uh, available emerging as um, sort of after the dot-com bubble burst, before and after, um, where you know, people were searching things on the internet and there was pressure to commercialize. Um, and so this data was made uh, useful by, by kind of helping um, the newly emerging industry of e-commerce to understand what are people most likely to click on next on a website to improve sales. And so this has kind of ballooned into um, a much larger sort of socioeconomic structure that we live in. So again, artificial intelligence systems increasingly mediate social situations and increasingly mediate high stakes social situations. Um, this has caused harm and continues to cause harm. For example, due to racial bias, gender bias, um, different kinds of biases, but also the ways in which we, in, you know, by default, bake value systems and politics into these kinds of technological objects. The point being here that this harm is not distributed equally across society. We are seeing an unequal distribution of this harm that effect, disproportionately affects already marginalized and oppressed groups. This is one of the pioneers in this space. This is Joy Buellamini, um, who introduced um, the problem or, or gave a, a very public um, voice to the problem of racial bias, specifically in facial recognition technology, very, very early on, and wrote a fantastic paper called Gender Shades together with the um, with Dr. Timid Guru, who was fired from Google about six months ago. This project came about when uh, Joy wanted to create a project, uh, sort of an art project in, in her class uh, with facial recognition technology. And she realized that this technology would only recognize her face um, when she put on a white mask. Her story and the um, technological problems that are related to that are very well documented in the documentary Coded Bias, which I recommend at this point. Um, there are numerous important scholars in this field. Joy is one of them, Timit Gebru, Deb Raji. Um, that there are many <clears throat> people who are doing very important work in this space. So it is fair to say that we're seeing a sort of stratification of this harm across the well-known fault lines of race. This is a paper that the technical folks in the audience are surely familiar with. Um, this is the predictive and equity and object detection paper, which essentially says, well, people with darker skin, skin tones are um, less likely to be detected by some of the systems that are included in sensors for autonomous vehicles. This is another well-known paper um, which talks about gender bias and large language corpora. Um, and this is, a, this is very important work by Virginia Eubanks, which talks about less of the design of these technologies, but more so the deployment of these systems in the welfare state. And she has coined the term, the, um, the digital poorhouse. Um, and she describes how actually the deployment of automated decision-making systems or systems that support decision-making in um, public agencies in the context of already uh, strapped resources and uh, growing workloads, which by the way, we're gonna see more of coming out of the pandemic actually vastly exacerbates um, class inequality in the United States. So let's loop this back to design inequality. Essentially, the idea of design inequality looks at design as a way of making society, including technology design, and really looks at how this is entangled with social inequalities across many different domains, uh, and I being one of them. What is important here and what I want, really want to push is that the, is the view that both design and inequalities are both superstructures that work at a sort of macro level, similar to what Shoshana Zuboff has observed in terms of surveillance capitalism, but there are also micro practices that happen in our everyday life that we are kind of creating and recreating in our everyday life. And these practices are about creativity, they are about power, they are about expertise, and they can both exacerbate or at least maintain these inequities, but they can also challenge them in different ways. Um, 
So we need to understand power in this context, right? And design has a particular power uh, in and of itself. It is all about shaping knowledge, shaping relationships, communities, beliefs, experiences, identities. These can then shape um, policies. They can, for example, shape um, the distribution of funds, which shapes research, and, and so we so we go. Um, and designers really have very powerful positions. And Stuart just spoke about that earlier in terms of the technologies that are uh, working um, on what we call AI systems. Um, design always is about seeking to influence behavior. That is what it is about. Design by design is about uh, influencing the course of events. Uh, and so therefore it is always uh, a powerful activity or social practice. I wanna to point to the work of Viktor Papanek at this, at this point who in 71 um, already observed this and has said, well, design has become a very powerful tool in which reshape our environment. And there is really a moral, he calls it moral responsibility for the designer. And um, society really makes it crucial for the group of designers to understand clearly social, economic, and political backgrounds of what they do, which links back to interesting points around literacy that were mentioned earlier by other panelists. Now we've seen all these kinds of issues emerge around um, bias, particularly in the context uh, of artificial intelligence, what comes to the rescue or has come to the rescue is ethics. And we've seen ethics pop up everywhere. Um, ethical AI was kind of the top technology trend in 2018. We've seen um, ethics boards emerge. We've also seen them implode. Um, we've seen a huge sort of issue around ethics as smoke screening, particularly in the context of uh, interdisciplinary research on issues around uh, the social impact of AI systems. Um, this has been picked up by the show Silicon Valley. If you don't know it and you're interested in the tech space, I recommend you watch it, where they introduced uh, and made fun of, of tethics, which is exactly that phenomenon. And so what is fair to say is that what we've seen in the past very often that there is a policy approach of ethics that seeks to influence the individualized behavior of or individual behavior of technology designers, or there's a technology approach whereby we kind of try to create a moral machine that makes the right decision on our behalf. What that can um, exclude is a view for the social problem that underpins this. And I, I would say this, of course, I'm a sociologist. So I wanna leave you with a few sort of thoughts or provocations. First, I think it is extremely important that we recognize that data is always social and making databases is world making. It is also an, a design activity that is about inclusion, about exclusion that has a lot to do with data classification and categorization. And we need to acknowledge that the social is in the data. We should also think about the fact that there is human agency in technology design. There are values in technology design. There are always politics in technology design. And I just grabbed a screenshot of this wonderful little tweet software isn't eating the world, humans are eating the world, and software is just the cutlery, which I think illustrates this quite nicely. Laura spoke about intersectional inequality, and I just want to underline that the notion that we are actually not dealing with single category issues, but that we are dealing with a social world, and that the social world is made up of individuals who all have multiple identities is extremely important. What is also extremely important to acknowledge is that when we say intersectionality and we use it in its original um, sort of notion that was developed by Kimberly Crenshaw and Patricia L. Collins, then we must acknowledge that we are reshifting or we're shifting focus onto lived experience. So intersectionality is about centering the lived experience of those who are experiencing the interlocking systems of privilege and oppression. So we need to take that seriously when we think about design. So we're kind of coming full loop here. How can we bring in lived experience expertise as part of taking intersectionality seriously? And this is the last one. Um, this is a fairly new one, which kind of points to the closing point I'm going to make in just a second. I think we need to talk about socio-technical, historical, and ecological literacies. So when we acknowledge the power of designers and we acknowledge that we need to integrate lived experiences and we kind of need to change how we play the game in a way, then we also need to acknowledge that actually there are always histories to the way in which we do things. There are histories to social practices. There is the looming threat or the existing threat of the climate emergency. Today in New York City, it's 36 degrees. 
um, these are things we can no longer ignore. And when we need to develop a more holistic view, the reason why I am including this little screenshot, this is a note from a student that I got recently um, who said, well, I, I completely changed how I think about my practice or my future career as a civil engineer. Um, and I really value that I can think about it holistically and I can make a difference. That is all to say that the next generation is really ready for this kind of work. And as the older ones, we need to make sure we put the infrastructure in place to facilitate and reward that with careers, for example. So to close, I think it is very much um, needed that we focus on social practice as a way of bringing all of these conversations together. And I just wanna quote, um, Lucy Sechman here, who, who is a very well-known anthropologist who has done uh, important work on technology design for a very long time, who says we need to reclaim the keyword design to refashion it. We need to do that deliberately with an eye to the tensions inherent in articulating projects in transformational change as small d design without reducing the supremacy of design with the initial capital letter. So she's speaking to top power here. The reason why this is important to do this through practice, and I'm just gonna geek out for just a, just a second more, um, is that when we think about practice, we are um, allowing ourselves to look at how things are made up that we do. So for practices, whether they are driving, whether they are exercising, cooking, or designing a technology are all made up of meanings, of materialities, and competencies. Um, and so all of these have a history and they are continually emerging, which is a very interesting observation in the context of deep learning, but that's probably sort of a, a cyber conversation. The reason why a car looks the way it does is because it is a continuation of the design of a horse carriage. The reason why some technologies used in the hiring funnel, and again, Laura spoke about this earlier, um, for example, those that analyze micro expressions or speech to predict things like personality, skill, and job fit. And actually, Alex, this relates to stability. And the reason why they are deeply discriminatory, or at least can be, is, for example, for people with disabilities, is because they are at their core based on a eugenicist belief system. And in order to get at that, we need to think about ethics in practice. We need to think uh, about how to take practice seriously and to develop these kinds of literacies that we spoke about. And I think four like these are extremely important for that. I'm very grateful to be here today. And this is where I'm gonna close. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mona. Thank you really very much uh, uh, to you and to Laura and to Stuart and, and Sandy for, for this fantastic array. We are only a few minutes late, which were actually well worth it. And uh, I, now it's the time to split up in the, in the breakout. Uh, 